This is SMSL's SU9 digital to analog converter. Now it measures excellently, but does it sound any good? Now just like its SH9 headphone app, which I reviewed recently, I got sent one to check out. If you saw my M200 review recently, this is not actually that radically different to the M200, except it uses a Sabre DAC chip rather than AKM. Let's have a look at some of the functionality. Now, first of all, well, it uses a standard power in connector. So no, up, no chance of upgrading the power supply in this. You're kind of limited in that aspect if you're one of those people who loves tweaking stuff. It has Bluetooth input, which has been popular on DACs recently, and your usual USB, optical, and coaxial. Now, interestingly with this is most people will probably use the USB input and I can say straight off the bat, it is pretty fine because I did try it against the coaxial and I didn't notice any improvement using a high-end converter through the coaxial rather than just using the built-in USB. Now, optical, well, some people will have optical on their motherboards. You may get 2496 performance out of it, but up to 192K, you may need a high-end optical cable. That can be a dicey proposition, as I've found it may not be so reliable, even if it does provide electrical and noise isolation from your computer's motherboard or whatever source you're using. Now, the other thing you have is balanced output as well as single-ended. Now, the benefit of balanced output, well, normally it was used for long cable runs. So for example, this thing can act as a preamp. So if you have a pair of active speakers, and like me, a lot of gear sitting around, the noise reduction benefits of balance may be beneficial, but still you're gonna have a good quality single-ended output. Say if you want to use a lot of tube amps are only single-ended, or you may have some kind of uh, matching component which is also single-ended. But if you do have, you can use either or, or both at the same time if you like, which is something someone asked me on a previous YouTube comment. So that's kind of the overview of this. Where the interesting stuff happens is actually in the settings. The SU9, like the SH9, comes with SMSL's remote control. Handily for this, you can actually control both the DAC and the amp if you buy both by pressing one button to control the amp and one button to control the DAC if you so desire. You can actually access all these functions through the remote control which presses in to access the, and turn to access the menu options, but here I'm just going to use the remote control as it's most convenient for what we want to do. Now you have a variety of options here, some of which are quite unique. And let's start with the input. Well, you have your usual input selector, no big deal there. The PCM filter I'll talk about mostly in the listening impressions. This is for regular music whether the, the kind of digital filter that is used for the conversion from digital to analog. Now these things are complex and you can get quite deep into this and learn a lot of stuff or think you learn a lot of stuff and actually end up knowing less than you believe that you do. I wouldn't worry about this too much. I usually suggest something like uh, the most accurate technically is called the brick wall digital filter, but it may, depending on the kind of music, sound a little bit hard and harsh and probably the least accurate is the fast hybrid, but maybe a little bit softer and maybe a bit easier listening and some people you know like uh, minimum phase or, or linear phase filters I usually used fast linear and there's an interesting comment on, on an Amazon review for one of the other SU9 DACs which suggested a particular filter for best listening through Bluetooth it's something to you play around with and see what difference it seems to make or doesn't make for you DSD filter I'll just tell you leave this at 47k cut off you don't all that is going to do is let in more high frequency noise if you set this higher uh, high, and DSD has a lot of high frequency noise, which is not music at all. Anyway, sound color was an interesting one. Uh, there are a variety of settings, which I'll talk about in the listening, and you can see what, what do they do. I actually found out, and I actually guessed what they did, and I was correct about what they did. So standard is the kind of measurement accurate one. If you've seen measurements online for this deck, you'll see them taken with the standard, and some people seem to, they seem to have avoided measuring all the others. For some reason, I don't know. Pre-mode, you can switch this on or off, whether the volume is variable or volume fixed. I didn't notice any difference in having it uh, in variable mode, particularly in terms of sound quality, unlike the D90, which seemed to change. We kind of lose a bit of sound quality, but you never know. Maybe some people have uh, compared it more carefully than I have. In terms of level matching, I had to leave it as volume variable. Now, next in there, we have the DPLL, another technical thing which is going to confuse the crap out of people which don't know anything about digital. Now, the uh, digital phase lock loop is how the uh, DAC locks onto a digital signal. And uh, the, um, basically, this adjusts the tolerance of the DAC for whether it can lock on or not. Most USB should be fine. If you have crappy USB, you may have to increase this up to the default of 7. And you can try 
you know, just setting it. If you have like an optical signal, you can't get 192 through. Maybe you can uh, set it into higher. And if you have a good quality USB source, try setting it to lower to see if you notice any difference. It may, it probably will control whether or not it locks on or not. Or maybe, um, maybe it might affect the sound. It's very hard to say. On my system, it made no difference because I seem to have good quality gear for. Uh, connecting to uh, DACs. Brightness, of course, if you like listening uh, you know, in a darkened room or at night, you'll probably want to uh, have that adjustment. Very Probably a uh, well, heavily demanded thing, considering I have various shit audio DACs with LEDs. I have to little put bits of tape over in the evening. Reset, you can reset everything if you've kind of got lost and things don't seem to be working. And you can see the version here, because if the version you have, or the version some other person reviews it with may have slightly different features or functionality or performance, well, then you can see the reason why maybe because they've changed some something in the firmware. So that's kind of the basic overview of the, the settings. And well, let's get on to my impressions of the sound. I tested the SU9 here against, well, SMSL's own M200. I also tested it with the, you can just see in between the components here, the Chord Mojo set up in here. We also have an IFI IDSD Neo. I'll talk about that a little bit in more in its own video because it is a DAC amp and we're talking about just a DAC here. So kind of double the price. More like comparing it to something like the SMSL SU9 and SH9 stack would kind of be more relevant, I think. So, but in, in anyway, I plugged them both into Audio GD's Master 9 amp to get a kind of absolute idea how well they sound in comparison. And I used uh, things like Finals D8000 Pros to evaluate them. Now, this is a kind of unrealistic combination. Most people probably wouldn't be using such, you know, expensive headphones and amplifiers with, you know, such a cheap DAC. So it was more to kind of get an absolute idea. So some of the differences I noticed are not something I think the average person would notice. I mean, the differences down at this level between these are kind of very subtle. And unless you're listening to like very highly recorded music and you're listening out for very subtle differences in, uh, how, say, instruments are presented, or the uh, depth of the sound stage, or that kind of thing, then you're probably not going to notice. I mean, for most people, it probably would be most, you know, the most music even I listen to, especially stuff I listen to at random in the car, which can range very considerably. Those kinds of things I'm, I'm just not going to notice at all, even listening here in my own home where it's pretty quiet. So in that, well, you know, I've talked about kind of the differences between DACs and using this thing called the coffee table analogy. Now, each of these, you know, both of these decks, for example, is, is designed to measure extremely well, so be extremely neutral, unless you select the sound color options, which we'll talk about a bit later. And so you generally can hear very the very subtle differences between the characters of, say, the AKM DAC and the M200 and the Sabre DAC in the SU9. Now, the coffee table analogy, I look at the high-end AKM DACs like the 4497 and 4499, such as in here, as being like a glass coffee table. It's kind of clean, like clear, smooth sound, but still it's like, it's like a glass window. I mean, you can see the trees outside here, but it's different... Looking through glass at, say, nature is very different to actually being in nature. So it's not quite a pure look on the world. It kind of is still there's something between you and the music, ultimately. But it does have a very smooth and, and kind of clear signature. You don't notice the window so much. You do notice the nature. Now, the for example, just to use the uh, Burr Brown DACs that are in the IFI as an example, I look at those as a wood coffee table. Now, depending on setup, and I'm thinking more of, say, the Cayenne, N6 Mark II, where one of the DAC modules was optionally a Burr Brown module. I kind of think of your wood coffee table. When set up right, they have a little bit of a organic kind of sound signature, which is kind of very pleasing to listen to, again, depending on the setup. Sabre, I kind of look at as metal. And uh, maybe like your metal coffee table, it has a little bit more presence in some ways. Now, again, a coffee table, whether it's wood, glass or metal, is still going to do the same job, but it has a little bit of a different character. And that's kind of how I look at these things. And if I listen like very carefully, there was a subtle difference that that kind of differences were present between these two decks. Again, you know, if I A, B'd them with most music, it probably not something I'd be able to discern in a blind test, for example, but there was just this subtle feeling like you listen to a whole track through one, through a whole track through the other, level match, and there's a slight difference in feeling how they come through. All the same, it was very, you know, it had a very kind of clean and clear sound if you left all the sound color options off. And again, with these DACs, they do have the, uh, the uh, digital filters that are built into the DACs enabled so you can switch between them and that will sometimes give you a subtle difference between the sound especially in things like uh, acoustic music and some 
Sometimes one will sound maybe slightly less aggressive than the other, especially if you're using, someone suggested on, in an Amazon review that if you're using Bluetooth, you should use a particular digital filter for best results. That's probably quite relevant there as they will affect the timing of the music and the kind of the feeling of depth. Sometimes like the hybrid filters will soften up things a little bit and maybe easier to listen with if you have more aggressive music, but again, can make things sound maybe a touch blurry in some respects and maybe you know can be too much of a good thing. So that's something to play with if you do get one of these DACs and whether you notice or not will probably depend on the music, your headphones, the hearing and all that. The interesting thing this did have were with these sound color options. Now the M200 has a couple of those as well. And I thought, what are these? And the manufacturer refused to tell me, but I guessed correctly in the end that they were adding degrees of even order harmonic distortion, which is distortion that is often induced in tube amps, although it can be induced in any audio circuit that it, even order harmonic distortion is kind of euphonic. It kind of makes listening very pleasant. And even order means that, say, if you have a one kilohertz tone, which is often used for measurements, you'll see a two, four, eight, 16, maybe kilohertz, even uh, the, the double, you know, quadruple, even order, basically, tone, tonal uh, distortion added in there. And it's very pleasant to listen with that. Now, third order harmonic distortion will go for like where there's a one kilohertz tone, you may th see a three kilohertz spike. And that gives a little bit of excitement to the music. And it turned out that uh, someone, one of my uh, Patreon supporters actually measured some of the SU8 and the sound colors and found that they did indeed do this. They introduced amounts of even order and third order harmonic distortion, depending on what you selected. So these are, now if you look at these graphs, I just have to advise you that a decibel scale is not a linear scale. So we tend to think of the spikes when we see in these as, as being huge, but no, they're actually not really. You know, for every drop of six decibels, you're basically halving the amount of sound. So when you get down, you know, down to minus 60 dB, you've got, you know, one hundredth the sound level that you had to begin with. These spikes are actually low overall, and they're not something that, you know, considering that most music doesn't usually hit peak, you know, minus zero dB, unless you're listening to compressed brick wall music, which by then, you know, you're not going to notice any of those subtle details anyway, because it's, the music has been distorted beyond compare by the uh, mastering process. So most music, even good quality music, is going to be down, you know, 20, could be down 20, 10, 20 dB. So you're not going to notice as a relative percentage these spikes, but you're going to feel that mm, the music sounds subtly different. And the only way I could get a noticeable difference was to switch from the very last sound color option immediately to the uh, no sound color option, where it did kind of notice that something had changed, but I couldn't put my finger on exactly what. And it's one of those things, like the digital filters, you just have to switch one in and see if you feel any different listening with it, and if you don't, you don't. And it might just help if you do find that, you know, even at this level, uh, noting that I am used to high-end DACs, you know, such as the Yggdrasil, I do find that DACs, at, you know, kind of at this lower level do sound a touch flat to, to my impressions compared to higher-end stuff, like the music sound depth is kind of lacking. So, I mean, for most music, you know, they're fine. And if you've never listened to any high-end gear, and this will be, you're looking to buy one of these things or say your first high-end DAC purchase, you'll probably find it, you know, be really fantastic. And again, with a, maybe with a little bit of system synergy, with a good amp and good headphones, you probably really enjoy it. And then, of course, then you go out and try someone's higher end gear and you go, oh God, this is what I've been missing. And then sorry about your wallet after that. But up to this point, there it actually is a pretty good DAC. Now, comparing to the Mojo, the Mojo, as usual, had the slight edge on musicality. It had a little bit more depth to the sound, a little bit more nuance. It is a very high-tech solution. It's completely unique as a design. It's not limited by the DAC chips, which do have to have various stages of output after it to filter out high-frequency noise and, and other things and amplify the sound, whereas the Mojo doesn't have that disadvantage, being able to basically its output stage or basically it's actually the digital to analog converter stage is the output stage it has none of that in between so sometimes it can have a slight bit of an edge in kind of how it presents music and giving it more kind of depth and feeling and that kind of thing the kind of thing that old school uh, r2r ladder dax did but without all the distortion that those things have as well but so back to the su9 i mean it we did fine uh, in general, and it was only, you know, using high-end gear that I could notice these subtleties for the most part. And I didn't find any issues with the performance as such. And it's something that you, as a DAC, you can play around, maybe adding the, uh, with the digital filters and the sound color to see if it makes you feel, enjoy the music more. Because adding a little bit of kind of coloration in or pairing this up, say, with a tube amp, you know, the Cavalli tube I hybrid sitting here I occasionally listen to, even though, you know, I do have the high-end gear here as well. That can be, you know, with a good tube, can be a nice 
matchup, which can be very enjoyable to listen with. And system synergy ultimately is kind of more enjoyable than worrying about you know measurement numbers and that kind of thing. So that's kind of how I looked at the uh, SU9. And I hope that was a helpful guide because it's not just about you know how something performs on its own, but how it performs relatively and how it can be useful. So if you did find that useful, hit the subscribe button and uh, the bell button to be notified when I have more and hopefully give you more information that will help you buy better when you buy audio gear. Also, if you'd like my buying advice, do be consider becoming a supporter. And again, if you ever consider buying me a coffee to say thanks or just as a kind of thank you, do so and sign up and message me immediately and ask questions and, and join in. We have a, a private chat so we can have a bunch of people there who we chat about audio gear and other stuff and you can see my impressions early on when I get gear in. You can help influence what gear I review. I'll be doing a, a variety of things ranging from in-ear monitors up to high-end gear and uh, well become part of the community and uh, help me help you buy the gear you need to get the musical enjoyment you want. So thanks once again for watching and I'll see you online.